Reaching Out for Animal Rights, Roar presents Sister Brother Animal. Welcome to episode two of my interview with Jim Mason, author of the groundbreaking book, An Unnatural Order, The Roots of Our Domination and Destruction of Nature and Each Other. In the last episode, Jim Mason shared his early upbringing on a farm, his meeting with Peter Singer, author of Animal Liberation. We also delve into major themes, including the importance of other animals on the developing human mind hundreds of thousands of years ago, and how awe and respect gradually turned into disdain and dominionism. With the relatively recent advent of hunting, herding, and the domestication of animals. After years of this domination and after the invention of writing about 5,000 years ago, this human supremacy is inscribed in the Bible, essentially granting humans license to abuse nature and her other creatures without consequence. Why, Jim Mason asks, do we need to go so far back in history? He answers, because in order to emerge from the threat of total annihilation, we need to understand how and when the enslavement of animals began, quickly followed by the enslavement of women and girls, and patriarchy, tribal wars, colonialism, and slavery in the Americas. We need to understand how the mindset of human supremacy, domination over, and alienation from nature and her other creatures got us into this mess in the first place. Interview of Jim Mason, author of An Unnatural Order, The Roots of Our Domination and Destruction of Nature and Each Other. I'm delighted to present to you episode two of my interview with author of this mind-blowing book, An Unnatural Order, The Roots of Our Domination and Destruction of Nature and Each Other. You start the book, interestingly enough, with a very striking example of dominionism more currently in the land grabs. Yes. Native indigenous people's land in the 1880s and the 1890s, which I thought is a striking kind of model yes. that hooks us into now. So why did you choose that model of dominionism to start? Your yeah, book? that's the first chapter because nothing I could think of in recent history History better illustrates that dominating worldview than what they call the land runs in Oklahoma soon after it became a state. When there were three or four different land runs where the federal government basically took the land back away from the Native Americans they'd created. The whole state had been a reservation. It was called the Indian Territory until it became a state. It became a state because they discovered oil. So then after having given it to the Native American people forever, it said in the act of Congress, they said, oh, no, wait a minute, there's oil down here. So that's when government began to give away Oklahoma to white settlers. Mostly people of European ancestry were told to get ready and go there and stake out a claim and you can have it for free. And that occurred several times in the late 1800s. I thought it was such a vivid illustration, not only of the greed of people for land, and for the selfishness and the arrogance of the Western people, Europeans and Americans at the time, that they could just go and take land that belonged to someone else, or land actually that didn't belong to anybody. It was native land, it wasn't yet under ownership. And the other part of that section of the book, vivid stuff about how we destroyed the prairie, the native prairie, the great grassland, they called it the great sea of grass that occupied what is now the Midwest, almost from border to border and from the Ohio Valley to the Rocky Mountains was this vast sea of native grasses. It was the North American equivalent of the rainforest for its diversity. Hundreds and hundreds of different species of animals and plants lived there. Some of the more notable and charismatic ones are the bison or the, what we call the buffalo, but hundreds and hundreds of species of birds and burrowing animals and Everything was destroyed as these farmers were given the right to own that land and convert it to agriculture. So what had been this huge expanse of natural diversity of plants and animals, a huge section of the North American continent, 
was turned into corn fields and soybean fields. And now it's called the Corn Belt and the Bread Basket of America. And it's part of what made America rich because once that area was farmed, all of the produce that it produced, corn and soybeans and so forth, could fatten animals and they could be sold and we could trade them. And so it was a huge chapter in the development of America as a rich and powerful nation. So I thought that chapter, that section about the conquest of Indian territory or Native American lands in the prairie was such a vivid way to show just how we could take over that part of the planet. Interestingly enough, most of the readers thought that was one of the most compelling and interesting parts of the book. And yet, the first editor at Simon & Schuster wanted to cut the whole thing. He said, this doesn't make sense. we got to cut all of this. He didn't get it. The guy is a professional writer and editor, and he didn't like the Oklahoma story at all. So I argued with him, and we finally compromised, so we cut it down a little bit. But it's a good part of the book. Yeah, it is a huge contrast and very very disturbing and impelling to understand dominionism. People don't remember it. But if you were alive today to remember what was called the Dust Bowl, mm-hmm. in the 1930s, uh, that same area was part of a succession of dust storms or wind storms that basically blew away the topsoil because what had been native prairie, the grasses protected soil. But once the farmers had cut open the soil and planted it in row crops, the winds came and blew it away. And that became the Dust Bowl of the mid-1930s. It was a big, big deal in America at that time. It was some of the first huge environmental disasters, environmental catastrophes that were caused by human beings. You anchored that history into so much detail. It just became alive. Your second chapter is called Before Agriculture, a world alive and ensouled. So would you take us back on a trip? Yeah, to our earliest ancestors and describe how they lived and the relationship they had to the living world and also to our sister, brother, animal kin. Yes, that chapter describes what life was like for human beings before we quote unquote discovered farming, agriculture, domestication of plants and animals. That domestication process began about 11,000 years ago. It started to happen soon after the Ice Age was over. The glaciers were melting and the earth was becoming crowded, but we'll get to the facts of the beginnings of agriculture later. So why do we need to understand what life was like before agriculture? What were the life ways of peoples before they became farmers of plants and animals? I call that the primal society, the primal culture, because it was the longest part of human existence. I don't know how educated people are on the history of the human species, but what we call modern humans, that's the current Homo sapiens sapiens, is supposed to be only about 150 to 200,000 years old. We were a mutation somewhere in Africa 150 to 200,000 years ago when we became the humans that we are today. But before that, For thousands and thousands and millions of years before that, we were hominids, and now they call them hominins, human-like creatures. We were kin to, well, we had a common ancestor with chimpanzees and gorillas and the other great apes. So they argue about how far back that is. I've read anywhere from five to 10 million years ago was what they call divergence, which means some mutation occurred and the new species was more human, more human-like than ape. And what they mean by that is it moved more erect rather than all fours. It moved more, it, our (laughs) ancestral primal species, moved more on the ground than in the trees, kind of like chimpanzees are today, and began to use tools that began to use its hands to manipulate things, which is tool use. So that was supposed to have occurred five to 10 million years ago. Now, from that point until agriculture is almost 10 million years that we were living this primal lifestyle. Uh, That's the longest part of humanoid hominin existence. Long before we even became modern humans, we were living in nature, just one of the animals out there. 
And if you understand the concept of what we'll get into with the shepherd idea that animals were the most important things around us, you have to try to imagine what life might have been like for our distant ancestor species. They lived probably pretty much naked out in the world as animals do. They don't necessarily live in shelters. They seek shelter wherever they can, maybe in forests or in caves or overhanging cliffs or whatever. But as the brain developed, they had to be amazed and intrigued by the sights and sounds of the other animals that were around them. And if you've ever been camping or if you've lived in a wilderness or a wild space, you have quite a sense of the presence of other creatures, mostly birds. But if you stay there for a long period of time, you'll hear wolves or coyotes. You'll see animals moving. So that was the primal experience, experiencing other species. The longest period of human-like existence was in this primal lifestyle of hunting and gathering. We call it hunting and gathering. It was mostly gathering. I prefer to call it foraging. We were foragers. We sought food in the environment around us, which gave us an extremely intimate knowledge of all of the plants and the animals in our immediate environment, because that's what we lived on. That was our source of everything. We knew every plant. We knew what was poisonous, what was not. We knew the animals that could harm us. We knew the animals that could help us. We were living in the world and aware of it and feeling a part of it up until the beginnings of agriculture. So I call that the primal lifestyle. We would see the similarities to other creatures. The human mind is developing, growing, yeah. making connections. Yes. And we see the stars and the moon and the changes in the sun coming up. And we see plants and flowers. And I think what you're also indicating is that these moving beings, our sister brother animal family, are fascinating and help establish connections in our mind, actually help us develop as humans. Is that a correct it's, assessment? It had to be very puzzling to the budding human mind. Bear in mind that even when we had branched off from the other apes, we were still quite intelligent as chimpanzees and gorillas are today. We were not completely stupid and oblivious. <laughs> we had a kind of mind already when we branched off. So a key part of intelligence is curiosity and being puzzled and wondering about things. This is exercise for the brain, and it helps us develop thought as we try to understand things and figure out things. In the primal mind, the main experience around them, we had no television, <laughs> we had no books, we had no school, but we lived in a world that was noisy, full of activity. When we look out and we see animals, we'd see they do things that we do. They have sex with each other and they urinate and they defecate and they eat and they chew and they sleep and they die and they bleed. And of course, we would be struck by the similarities. So we would think that as some tribal people, anthropologists noted that they considered the animals in their world as just other peoples that didn't speak the language. And in some cases, in what they call totemic society, one of the more charismatic animals would be the totem of the tribe. And the people would believe in their superstition that this animal was extraordinarily important to their tribe, that this was the animal that taught them how to hunt and how to live in the world. And this animal gave them permission to kill its members and eat them. And of course, they have to have a lot of ritual surrounding that act of killing. But yeah, animals were special in a way that's hard for us to even comprehend today. But some of the tribal peoples in the world, the few that still survive, understand this observation, this feeling, this sense of kinship with other animals. Even though many of them do kill and eat them, it has to involve a lot of rituals and ceremonies and all kinds of magic is required to be able to do this to kinfolk. Yeah, you're entering our third chapter here, Animals, the Most Moving Things in the World. And you spoke about the totem societies. How do these totem societies relate to the creation stories or myths? Yeah, that's something I ran across in reading a lot of the anthropology. One book in particular pointed out that in almost all of the known creation stories, whether we start with our own as set out in the Holy Bible, the Garden of Eden and all that, are there creation stories of similar cultures all the way back into history and prehistory. Native American people, Asian tribal people, African tribal people, they all have a story that they use to explain how the world began. And what's so interesting, just about all of them have in common, animals were here first. 
it's amazing that animals were the first beings and then humans would come later. And if you think about it, that's the story in Genesis, isn't it? God created the heavens and the earth and he created all the animals. And almost as an afterthought, he creates Adam and then Eve and gives it all to them. But the similar creation story among tribal or primal people was animals were here first. The earth was occupied by animals. And when humans occurred in the world, they didn't know anything. They didn't know how to hunt or to fish or to build fire or to build shelters. And the animals, probably the totem species, the special animal, taught the people of the tribe or the subculture how to do things. And that became their totem. And this was their teacher, their great brother figure for them. But it's interesting how many of the tribal or primal societies have this creation story. And then when you read anthropology, it's known that creation stories are the most important legend or myth of any culture. A creation story basically is a kind of a summary of the worldview of those people. It sets out their paradigm, as it were. We are prairie dwelling people and our totem is the coyote. And the coyote taught us everything. They don't worship coyote, but the coyote is a special kinfolk. So it's interesting that this is such a common theme in societies. The creation story is the most important story of any people. I found that fascinating. I think I saw from your book and others I've read that the change from simple foraging gathering fruits and berries and different root vegetables, leaves, the transition to hunting. You're the first person who's written about or researched how hunting may have begun yeah. in terms of men's perception of women, maybe yeah. as gods. Yes, I, I wrote in the book, A Natural Order, uh, kind of the, what... <laughs> Some have thought to be an outrageous opinion, an outrageous observation that maybe men hunted not so much for meat and protein as for the power that they believed resided in the animal. So men being jealous of women's power in the culture, women were the life givers, women were the food providers. Men sort of felt like they had to do something to prove, there to were. show you know, that they were participating. So I thought, what if they actually hunted, bring back a special animal and the powers of that animal to kind of prove to the tribal group, to the kin group, look how important we are. We have brought this in. Now, how did they acquire a taste for meat? That's an interesting story, too. I've, I've read in several places, the speculation is we probably started eating meat as scavengers, not as hunters. And this is probably way before the modern human species that I've spoke about, the 150, 200,000 year old modern humans that we are now, but way before that, when we were just more or less human-like apes wandering around, maybe there were prairie fires and some of the meat might have been cooked already. So maybe they picked at it and maybe they decided that it tasted like something they could have. And when people did that, it enabled them actually to move farther because they could probably find scavenged remains just about anywhere and they didn't have to look for fruits and vegetables. Now, again, we're guessing, educated guessing, how exactly did they take up hunting? Uh, no one knows for sure, but perhaps they observed the hunting practices of other animals, the stalking and the chasing and the lying in wait and maybe using tools to, to surprise an animal and kill it. And then having tasted meat, maybe they learned how to cut it up and cook it. But we don't know exactly how hunting began, but we do know that early humans, humanoid creatures were using tools. They may have had tools to cut up the carcasses to get the scavenged meat. And then somebody decided, well, let's try to kill with that tool. But it's interesting to speculate how that part of meat eating began and how it developed into planned hunting with deliberate construction of tools like spears and arrows that were developed to learn how to kill and process animals' bodies for meat. This is something that no one has really studied that much. It's something that we have to speculate about until we get better information. Especially because it is prehistory and there's yes. only anthropological tools or artifacts. I thought that we copied the tigers and lions and we became copycats thinking that was normal or necessary. But yeah, and the fact that men did not associate intercourse with giving birth. So it must have seemed yep. like... That's true. That's important. I, I find that a lot of people stumble on that when I mention it. They can't believe that we didn't always know that 
The act of sex produced fertilization of the female egg, male sperm, female egg, produced pregnancy and a baby. We didn't always know that. My theory is that we could have known that probably only after we began to domesticate animals and control their sex lives, controlling male and female animal bodies to produce livestock when we were able to fully understand sexual reproduction and the male role in it. But anthropology I've read says pre-agricultural people didn't really have a sense of fatherhood as we know it today. The man might have been related to the family as an uncle or a friend of the family and the mother, but it wasn't known that he actually produced something that became the baby. Sex and birth are nine months apart, so they might not have connected the two until they began to control that and the animals that they were domesticating. Would you describe hunting rituals and what their purpose was? I think because animals were so important to the human mind and the culture, and there was a sense of kinship, a sense of brotherhood and sisterhood with the other animals. It wasn't a welfare kind of a sense. It wasn't a humane impulse so much as that there were other people like us, other tribes with other languages. And if you were to kill a member of one of the other species, it probably was a big deal emotionally because of the belief that animals had powers and souls and so forth. So human beings being <laughs> occasionally sensitive <laughs> creatures, I'm sure that the tribe of hunters had to go through some ceremonies to soften that guilt and that emotional stuff. Supernatural stuff had to occur, superstitious things. They had to dress up in crazy outfits and put paint and dance around the fire. Probably had to do that for days to, I can't think of the psychological term for that, but if you ceremonialize and ritualize something that's stressful, produces emotional tensions, you can soften that and go ahead and do it anyway, kind of like they used to have before they went to war, before they went to battle with another neighboring tribe, they had to have the war dance and put on the war paint. They had to really prepare themselves emotionally to do this stressful, emotionally upsetting thing. So hunting, even though our ancestors did hunt animals and kill them for food, it wasn't done as easily then as it is now. It took a lot of emotional work in a form of ritual to pull that off because of the belief that animals had powers and souls and that they might be kinfolks. And when they killed a member of a species, that was their totem animal. Part of the belief system was that the master of that species, the great caribou or the great stag or the great buffalo or the granddaddy, the totem animal of that species, gave them permission to hunt, to kill the members of that herd, so long as they did the rituals. So it was kind of like a bargain. It was kind of like a compact. You can kill and eat us so long as you do this first. And this was part of the superstition of a lot of the hunting tribes. And I point out in a book that the importance of hunting has been exaggerated a lot. I think because of male bias and anthropology, it seemed to be that back in the day, before we were really more thoroughly scientific about studying our ancestors, most of the anthropology field was men, elite men. Their scholarship wasn't the best. They were probably aristocrats and it was a hobby. And they tended to write about their own prejudices, and their own outlook, which was male-centered. So when they were writing about, say, primal man or agricultural people, they only looked at the male side of it and everything looked like hunting to them. Men hunted. Oh, therefore, hunting was important. But when by the 30s and 1930s and 40s, anthropology was getting to be a little more of using empirical evidence and actually observed people closely and counted, literally observed and counted the things that they ate, even in so-called hunting cultures in Africa, notably the people of the Kalahari Desert, it seemed that almost 90% of all the food that they took in was plant-based. Hunting was occasional, and the meat was not that big a part of the diet. It was kind of like it was a lucky thing once in a while. And it wasn't always large animals. We like to think of our ancestors were out hunting mastodons and mammoths and large animals and buffalo. Well, they might have done that occasionally by accident, but mostly the animals that they were hunting were pretty much small animals, burrowing animals, maybe even reptiles. So From hunting has been exaggerated a great deal. From your book, I understand that boys and men went out together, no women, and actually inflicted pain on each other in order to kind of yeah, it's kind of, toughen themselves up. Yeah, initiation rites, you know, they have to get psyched up to go out and do something bloody. 
And I'm arguing in the book that the men were doing that as kind of a compensation for their perceived lack of power because the female was more central and important to the tribal group. Women produced babies, which was a miraculous, shocking thing at that time. And it was a women's only thing. Men weren't thought to have any part in it. Also, since most of what they ate was plant-based and was probably collected by the women and their small children. They were the essential foragers. Women had power in the kin group, basically an extended family. Maybe the group was 20 to 30 people, maybe three generations, the same family. And women were very central to the maintenance of life there. Babies and food have this wild theory. Some think it's wild, but I think it's plausible that men had to compensate for that. Hunting was a way to kind of prove your worth and show that you had something important and you brought back these powerful animals for the tribe. There's a book by Dr. Robert Sussman called Man the Hunted. Yes, it's right. Primates, Predators, and Human Evolution. And exactly. it's kind of a yeah. funny book in a way. I know that book. Yes, we were more hunted than hunter probably. Right. And so maybe it was a kind of a way of dealing with all the fear, you know, to yeah. like put it onto innocent animals. Yes. Yeah, we're going to turn around and attack us. So you described about the protein versus power aspects of hunting. Yeah. In other words... It wasn't necessarily because they needed a certain amount of protein, which of course is in all plant food, but they yes. need power and to, to compensate for the feeling of powerlessness in well, relation. It was, it was a spectacular, and I emphasize that spectacular food providing event. Go out and collect nuts and berries is kind of boring and mundane. It's nothing much to brag about there. Daily routine thing, it much wasn't anything emotional about it. It's just same old, same old. But when you bring back an animal that's believed to be powerful and a member of the tribe, a kinfolk, that is a spectacular. Can you imagine, like, the men coming back into the camp with this thing over there? It must have caused quite a bit of foot stamping and cheering and clapping and, oh, my God, look what we've got now. It was special. Caused quite a ruckus. Caused quite a bit of going on. And then the feasting might go on for days, especially because of that belief in the animal powers and the animal kinship. That caused a, quite a bit of celebration, probably. We've been talking with animal advocate, journalist, lawyer, researcher, and author of this book, An Unnatural Order, The Roots of Our Domination and Destruction of Nature and Each Other. The depth and the breadth of this book is mind-blowing. Thank you. Thank you.